Next, a markup session for a report on the year 2000 census. In September, the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee discussed whether to count each person or use statistical sampling to estimate the population. So we now have returned to the um, sampling and statistical adjustment in the decennial census fundamental clause, uh, which we will now uh, take up. And I know Mr. that there is going to be significant discussion about this. Yes. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that it be considered as read and then proceed to members having an opportunity to give their views on that report and further consider it. Uh, without objection, the uh, report is, will be considered as read. Uh, let me. Uh, Ms. Meek, before you do that, let me sort of set the parameters here and I will give a statement and then we'll recognize members in turn to discuss uh, this report. It is, uh, it is identical, the report is identical to the one that was scheduled for consideration on June 20th. At that time, I had strong reason to believe that the report would not receive uh, a fair and objective review. I felt that there were some misconceptions about the report and some uh, some concern that was being reflected at that time, so I took it off the table uh, for consideration at that time. Uh, now that members have had uh, the report for several months, uh, I hope that each member has had a chance to read it carefully and objectively. Uh, the report examines sampling and adjustment in light of the issues raised by committee members from both sides of the aisle during our hearings, in particular concerns about accuracy, legality, risk, and erosion of public confidence and participation raised by Congresswoman Meek, Congressman Barrett, and Congressman Hastert, among others. Those of you who were present at the committee hearings know that the issue of sampling has been approached objectively and on the merits as the House Committee with sole authorizing responsibility for the decennial census, as this committee is, we have to consider very seriously any changes that affect our constitutional charge, which is to carry out the census. Sampling as it affects apportionment of the House is indeed such a really fundamental change in the way that the census has been conducted in previous uh, uh, decennial uh, censuses. Although the census has always, always missed some people, and I think there's uh, nobody could guarantee that we would ever uh, actually count everyone, the Bureau has actually gotten closer and closer to counting everyone uh, as uh, the uh, procedures for taking the census have been refined and, and improved. It's estimated that in 1940 the census missed about 5.4 percent of the overall population of the United States at that time. From then on, the undercount went steadily down to 1.2 percent in 1980. However, in 1990, it did indeed go back up just a fraction to about 1.8 percent. Meanwhile, the costs of taking the census have escalated dramatically as we've come closer to a 100 percent census count. The Census Bureau says it wants to use adjustments based on sampling to get a perfect census at a low price. These are indeed valiant goals and something that I'm sure both sides of the aisle can support. However, the Bureau has yet to prove to Congress and the American people that sampling will not put at risk the accuracy of our constitutional mandate for taking a census in the first place. That constitutional mandate, the single most important function of the decennial census, is to allot seats in Congress and provide our state and local governments with the population counts with which to redraw legislative districts. It is therefore incumbent upon us at the federal level to enable those who must carry out these obligations to do so in a lawful and effective way. At the 1992 redistricting conference, Commerce Department officials learned what was necessary for local government officials to carry out their apportionment and redistricting functions, and again, the most important functions of the census. And the Commerce Department printed a copy of the major recommendations adopted at that conference. And the second of eight major recommendations reads, and I'm quoting, statistical adjustment, any adjustment for undercount or overcount must produce counts, not subject to sampling error estimates, for population 
race, Hispanic origin, and voting age for each state-defined block and election precinct and must be provided to state legislatures no later than the Public Law 94-171 deadline of April 1, 2001. The states must be assured early that there will be only one, one set of numbers. This critical recommendation lists three things necessary to validate the use of statistically adjusted numbers. One, the counts cannot be subject to sampling error estimates. Two, accurate counts must be provided for each state-defined block and election precinct. And three, states must be assured early that there will, quote, only be one set of numbers. Unfortunately, I have to note that the Commerce Department and the Bureau have ignored every, every element in this important recommendation. As the Committee has learned, census counts based on statistical adjustments would fail to meet each of these three requirements. Sampling might be a stati statistician's dream, but it will be a redistrictor's nightmare. As we who are familiar with polls, and I think everybody on this panel is, uh, know very well, Sampling techniques, by definition, have associated measurable error. This is unavoidable. Census counts based on statistical sampling will have ranges of error which grow wider and wider the smaller the geographical unit involved. The narrower the level of geography, the smaller the number of persons and the larger the error generated by the sampling techniques. In other words, while sampling might provide better accuracy about the population in a high level of census geography, such as a state or county, <clears throat> there is a decreased, dramatically decreased accuracy in smaller areas. So while it may not, be, uh, may not matter to some people that the total population of a census tract is somewhere between 9,500 and 10,500, it is a critical matter to redistrictors who must abide by court edicts to have zero tolerance for population deviation for purposes of redistricting. They must have one accurate number, not a range of numbers, in which to draw lines. Which number within the range is the redistrictor to use? The bottom line is that statistical techniques naturally produce margins of error. So let's not kid ourselves that there will be a one number census. Unfortunately, statistical techniques have an even more profound problem than relating to accuracy. The legal question of whether sampling can be used for purposes of reapportionment is still very much undecided. Title 13, Section 195 of the United States Code reads, except for the determination of population for purposes of apportionment of, of the House of Representatives and Congress among the several states, the Secretary shall, if he considers it feasible, authorize the use of the statistical method known as sampling, except for. Uh, the uh, uh, reapportionment of the congressional districts, it, it would authorize the use of sampling. I believe it is a real strength to construe this language to mean anything other than, a real stretch to construe this language to mean anything other than what it says directly. Even the language of our country's highest law appears to indicate a count based upon physical reality rather than estimation techniques. Article 1 calls for an actual enumeration, and Section 2 of the 14th Amendment reads, Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state. Other problems are also apparent in this matter. The Census Bureau claimed it was technically able to perform the 1990 census adjustment with greater accuracy, but months after the 1990 census, technical problems and mistakes with the adjustment continued to be discovered by uh, analysts. In fact, the original estimated undercount of 2.3% turned out to be demonstrably wrong. It was really only about 1.6 percent. If there had been an adjustment to the 1990 census as planned, uh, and this was a particular uh, sensitive matter to me, a seat in the House of Representatives would have been shifted from Pennsylvania to Arizona by an error in a computer program. The error remained undiscovered for months after Secretary Mossbacher's July 1991 decision not to adjust buried under layer upon layer of complications in the statistical procedures. At that time, the Bureau's sample was a massive undertaking, including 150,000 households. For the 2000, year 2000 census, the Bureau plans a sample five times that large, or about 750,000 households. With sampling, you're not only adding sampling error, but you're increasing the risk of technical error as well. 
Another disturbing problem about the use of statistical techniques to complete or adjust the census counts is that a choice of estimation of methodologies or change in assumptions can directly affect the outcome of the survey. The committee report points out that according to one expert reviewing post-1990 adjustment alternatives among five reasonable alternative estimation methods, none of the resulting apportionments of the House of Representatives were the same. Eleven different states either lost or gained a seat in at least one of the five models uh, that were used to compute uh, the, uh, the reapportionment. For the 2,000-year census, out of the multitudes of statistical techniques that could be considered by the Census Bureau, two distinct methodologies were tested by the Bureau in the 1995 census test, which was a precursor of uh, how to go about structuring and modeling for the 19, uh, the 2000 year census. In comparison, comparing the results of the two methods, a Census Bureau memorandum concluded that one technique increased the estimate after non-response follow-up among African Americans and renters, while the other technique did not. The memo goes on to say that while both techniques increased the post non-response follow-up estimates for Hispanics, only one of them increased the estimate for Asians and Pacific Islanders. The problem of subjectivity was recognized by then Secretary of Commerce, Mr. Mossbacher, who said in his decision not to adjust the 1990 census that the unsettling danger of statistical adjustment, quote, is that the choice of the adjustment methods selected by bureau officials can make a difference in apportionment, and the political outcome of that choice can be known in advance, close quote while the outcome of the enumeration process cannot be directly affected in such a way. Members of the committee, the bottom line with regard to the census and with regard to the support is that sampling and statistical adjustments to the constitutional census will create many more problems than they attempt to resolve. So I would urge your support, your careful consideration for this important report, which calls for our best efforts for a traditional count based on physical evidence that a person really does exist and is therefore qualified to be included as part of the 2000 year decennial census. And the clerk would now call up the report. Sampling and statistical adjustment in the decennial census, fundamental flaws. As indicated by the request of the gentleman in California, the report is considered as read, and I would now We'll be pleased to recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Mrs. Meek. I have a point of personal privilege, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady will state it. I'd also like to announce that our ranking member, Mrs. Collins, is not here because she's in the hospital. And we're very concerned about that. Mr. Chairman, I have here in my hand um, a document that was distributed, presumably by a member of your staff. and. This particular document uh, sort of goes, flies in the face of the directions which have been handed to us here in the House regarding the dissemination of anonymous material. Uh, not only on the floor of the House did the Speaker make this assertion, but this was also uh, misused in this committee. Uh, if you remember the subcommittee with Mr. McIntosh's committee where an anonymous document was given out. I'd like to ask a few questions regarding this. One is, uh, each of you has one of these, I hope. It says, Meek Bill recognizes accuracy problem with sampling. This particular article was, as I understand it, distributed by a staff member. Why did they prepare this anonymous document? And it's misleading also. And I'd like to know what is the dissemination of it. Uh, it's misleading, to say the least. Well, I, I would certainly think the gentlelady uh, sh should, uh, at this point, point out in what way she considers the, uh, the re uh, representation to be misleading. If, in fact, uh, she feels that way, I would appreciate your... Uh, First of all, uh, she mentioned that the Commerce Department would accommodate my bill. First of all, I don't know in what terminology is she using accommodate. Does that mean that the Census Department perhaps agrees with one of the things I brought before this committee? 
that is to use indigenous people. And if we were to sample, we should really go into uh, the census tracts instead of using the county. Uh, whatever she means by co accommodation think, is not clear. I think what, what is intended there, Congresswoman Meek, was uh, indicated in a um, press release that appeared, I believe, in the Detroit newspaper quoting Commerce Undersecretary Mr. Ehrlich, who, who indicated in that uh, press release, at least, that he promised caucus members Thursday that Census 2000 would commit to a direct count of 90 percent of residents in every census tract, which consists of a few blocks rather than every county. And I think that was in direct response to the concern which you had raised, and that is that the smaller the unit, uh, the, m the more likelihood for inaccuracy in terms of a, of a statistical sampling. So that is the reference. You're right. I just uh, said that uh, in my preceding statement. If that's what the writer meant by accommodation, yes, then she's right. But in terms of the other accommodation she's talking about, as I see it here, she's referring more to my direct opposition to sampling as a sampling making the census more accurate. If that's the case, then this is uh, a, a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of what was said in my presentation to this committee. She said I indirectly admitted that the, uh, the Commerce Department is indirectly admitting to sampling's accuracy problem. That certainly could not have come from any use of my report here. And that's why I wanted to know about this. I think there is a misrepresentation. There is also some referencing, uh, indirect referencing, uh, to, uh, to my testimony on this bill. I will let the record note that you uh, take exception to the uh, to The, uh, yeah. uh, the third statements thing the I mentioned, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have answered is it has anonymity. It's not signed. It doesn't say who released it. Uh, the dissemination of it. The, uh, the, and that, uh, that, I regret that was an unfortunate omission, that that should have been identified as a who had generated this uh, report. I can assure you that uh, that was uh, an oversight and an unintentional mistake. It was no attempt to be, to have an anonymous uh, presentation. I can report to you that it was, in fact, uh, uh, the staff member who prepared that and uh, the disseminated. It should have indicated that in the, in the uh, statement itself. If I could say one more thing without sounding preachy, this is the second time that has happened in this committee, and hopefully you as a chairman who have stood up to all the fairness in this committee will see that that doesn't happen again. I can assure the mm -hmm. gentlelady that we will make every effort to ensure that nothing is produced that is, ident is not identified by author. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, further discussion, are there, are there are there comments or discussion on the uh, on the report itself? Uh, I'm sorry, the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Chairman, uh, to establish the fact that on the minority side, sometimes some of the minority agree with the majority side and the chairman, I, I uh, would have to confess that I am disturbed with the possibility of how we would move in uh, changing the methodology of making the census. And at this time, I'm prepared to support the chairman's position on this matter. Thank the gentleman for his support. Uh, the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Meek, is recognized again for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I strongly oppose this report, Mr. Chairman, and first I'll tell you some of my personal uh, opposition to it. If you remember in the Constitution it mentioned about counting and who should be counted, and it mentioned three-fifths, now, I wonder if this committee and everyone else understands uh, to whom the con Constitution was referencing. It was referencing people like me. So, happily, the 14th Amendment came along, and you amended it, so now everyone is counted. But that was my first uh, indication as I read the Constitution uh, as it originally talked about the census. My second position, Mr. Chairman, is that if we do use a methodology where we cannot get to all of the people, and we know that the regular head count methodology that has been used in the past, where they have tried to count every head, did not get all of the people. As a matter of fact, it did not count the people that I represent. I represent like 75% of the people that 
a, a mention that will probably be overlooked. Well, my job here in the Congress is to bring that to the attention of this committee. Therefore, trying our very best to get an accurate means of sampling. But I'd like to ask for his unanimous consent uh, that my entire remarks be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. I believe each of us wants an accurate census count and that the 2000 census should count everyone and we should make up for some of the errors that were made or oversights that were made in the last census. I go back to my time as a preacher, as a teacher, when I always sat, noticed my students sat, some of them sat in the front row and some sat on in the back row, and it was easier for those on the front row to hear and discern what I said. But many times the ones on the back row did not. That did not mean that I should not try to contact and reach those students who were on the back row. So the Constitution requires that we adjust the census in the same way that I did as a teacher, to those who were easily accessed and easy to reach, as well as those who sat in the back. We must try to count everyone. We should not say that this particular methodology is better because we've used it all the time, knowing that there was significant undercount. The report in its current form attacks the use of sampling, but the report is unfair because it does not explain why the Census Bureau is proposing the sample. If you read this report thoroughly, you see very little mention of the undercount as a rationale for proposing the sampling. You look at the six findings that are on page two of the report. There is no finding explaining why the Census Bureau has recommended two types of sampling. There is no finding that the Census Bureau is proposing to use sampling for two reasons. And their two reasons are to come closer to counting everyone and to reduce costs. One type of sampling that they have uh, proposed called integrated coverage measurement calls for a sample of 750,000 households to correct for the undercount that has been present in all past censuses. This undercount, I think, deserves recognition by the committee as a serious problem. I have not heard the committee uh, direct their attention to the real cause of the undercount. But look at how the, the report unfairly treats the undercount problem. No mention of the undercount on page one, no mention of on page two, and I could go on and on, page three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Pages nine and 10 briefly refer to an undercount, but they don't explain what the undercount problem is. No mention of it on page 11. On page 12, there's a brief discussion of whether sampling will help solve the undercount problem, but still, no explanation of what the undercount problem is. Go to 13, no mention, 14, no mention. There's a one sentence reference to undercount on page 15, but again, no, no, no answer, explanation. Mr. Chairman, I could go on and on showing you where the, this committee, the findings of this committee, greatly overlook the real cause of the undercount. Finally, in one sentence, near the bottom of page 20, the report says, the committee is concerned that there has always been an undercount and that in the 1990 census, there was an increase in the differential undercount of minorities. That is, my colleague, uh, the entire explanation mentioned in this uh, committee report. That's why I deem it unfairly illustrated. The committee's report, in my opinion, is backwards. The problem should have been clearly explained at the beginning, not barely mentioned at the end. Since the report almost completely ignores the undercount problem, let me remind this committee of the undisputed facts about the undercount in the 1990 census. In August 1992, the Census Bureau concluded that the 1990 census had failed to count about 4 million people, or about 1 6 percent of the nation's population. This undercount, mind you, was not random. The Census Bureau reported in 92 that the 90 undercount was above average for African Americans and other minorities. That's extremely important to me to see that the people I represent and the people you represent and the entire Amer American public is represented by the census. The African Americans, in, Africa, in the African Americans, the undercount was 4.5%. That's high. 
<clears throat> for Hispanics, it was 5%. For American Indians, Eskimos, and Aleutian Islanders, it was 4.5%. For Asians and Pacific Islanders, it was 2.3%. I yield to this committee that these people are Americans too. This is our country too. We love this country, we want to be counted, we want to be represented in the Congress. The Census Bureau reported in 92 that for some states, the undercount was above the national average of 1.6%. For an example, in California. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the lady be given two additional minutes. Without objection, sir. Thank you, thank you. For example, in California, about 835,000 people, 2% of the population, were not counted. In Maryland, about 100,000 people, or 2.1% of the population, were not counted. In my state of Florida, about 260,000 people, about 2% of the population, were not counted. So it, there may be of interest to each of you to know that in each of the larger cities and in the rural places in this country, that was an undercount. It's a serious problem. I'm calling it to the attention of this committee and ask that you look very seriously at this report and look at the implications of the report. Now, the other type of sampling that the committee asked for, uh, the, proposed by the census, is the so-called sampling for non-response. If they're going to do 90% of the people and use 10% to find out where the other people are, that is going to bring more accuracy. In that this sample, if you take a, a 1 in 10 sample of non-respondents, after 90% of the households in the country have been responding, this sampling will give 500 million as compared to trying to count. It's going to save that amount of money. So am I saying save money and don't count accurately? No. I'm saying do both. Count accurately by using sampling and count accurately by saving money. But criticizing the details of this report, Mr. Chairman, uh, certainly this committee, uh, this report seems to be a wholesale condemnation of sampling. And I, I say that because you and I and other members of this committee have seen very astute academic bodies who have been proponents and who still are of the sampling techniques. And they are saying if it's used carefully, carefully. And we are questioning the Committee on National Statistics of the National Research Council entitled Sampling in the 2000 Census. And these experts say a combination of sampling for non-response, and that's what the Census Bureau is asking, follow-up, and for integrated coverage measurement is key to conducting a census at an acceptable cost with increased accuracy and overall quality and reduce differential undercount. And let me go to another one. In the September report of the American Statistical Association, they concluded that the use of sampling in the 2000 census has a potential to increase the quality and the accuracy of the count and also reduce costs. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I propose to you that many groups in this country is opposed to, to this particular report. And these people, I have letters from almost all of them opposing this report. And the members of the Census Advisory Council, including the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, the Business Roundtable, the NAACP, the National Association of Counties, the National Association of Towns and Townships, the National Conference of State Legislators, the National Council of La Raza, the National, I could go on and on. These groups support uh, the use of sampling to improve the accuracy. The Japanese American Citizens League, in a letter to the members of the committee, said that it opposes the committee's report because by bearing the use of sampling means that the outcome of the census will be no different from the past, unequal and unfair. This is a one-sided attack, this report is, on the use of sampling in the census. I guess my rationale again, Mr. Chairman, is that I don't want people underrepresented or uncounted. The Constitution calls for everyone getting a head count, everyone being counted. What's the best way of doing it? You can't do it by the old method, <clears throat> but you Jeez. can do it if you go into the areas and count 90%, and that 10% that you miss, you come back and use sampling. Now, the statisticians the have spoken up has expired. And I appeal to you, Mr. Chairman, to be sure that this is fairly done. And this report Thank doesn't show it. Uh, and I would not recognize the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes. And I do note the, the boat is in progress. And upon the conclusion of Mr. Hastert's 
remarks, we will recess briefly, and I would urge all members to return so that we can complete the debate on this report and, and uh, have a vote. The gentleman from Illinois. I thank the chairman. I, I think one of the first things that we take the oath of office, we stand in that great hall of the people, hold our hand up and say we'll support the Constitution. The Constitution is pretty plain. It says, the Constitution says actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as the law shall direct. Actual enumeration is from Webster and other uh, areas of uh, definitions, means, counting one after another. It also ascertaining the number of, to specify one after another, a roll call of persons one after another. The Constitution uh, may confuse some people. And let's see what the Congress says in Title 13 of the United States Code, Section 95. It says, except for the determination of population for purposes of apportionment, the representatives in Congress among the several states, the Secretary shall, if considers, if feasible, authorize the use of statistical methods known as sampling. Only except when you're doing something other than enumerating uh, for the purposes of, of apportionment of the representatives of Congress. And of course, we know that the census is the means of apportionment, the numbers of Congress. Quite simply, I, I, I guess, uh, in a discussion that we pulled back from the first hearing that we had, one of the experts, quote unquote, from the Department of Congress uh, answered a question I posed before him. I said, if you had $5,000 in $1 bills and you were being paid your salary, in a, a quantum of $5,000. Uh, would you want statistical evidence to prove that that was actual $5,000 in that package of bills? And you can look at thickness and compression and wear and tear of the money and all those things. Some of the same things that our good friend from, from Florida says we need to look at. Uh, but you know, the expert said, I'd rather count my $5,000. And I think that really comes down, when you're looking at an apportionment, I will not yield. When you look at an apportionment of Congress, and you look at a census box, and census track levels, and when you look at my state of Illinois, when we had zero deviation for uh, 19 of the 20 congressional districts, and one district had a, a deviation of one person, that's what the laws upheld. That's what the courts upheld. And that's what the Constitution says we should do. Now, there may be nice designs by members of the, of the Commerce uh, Department to say, well, we'll do this and we'll do that. We don't have to put all these people in the streets. We don't have to count, knock on doors and households and count. We don't have to go down uh, the alleys and see who the homeless are. We'll guess, because guess makes it easier. Guess we can, you know, just kind of work it this way or we can work it that way. And I'll tell you, folks, sampling, sampling, and I've been through statistics and the courses and, you know, those types of things. Sampling is an educated guess. Sampling is taking evidence that you try to extrapolate down into uh, a, an educated guess of what something is. Nobody ever said that a sample was perfect. Nobody ever said that a sample was exact. Now the, the Commerce Department, in its efforts to move through this, has said, well, this is sampling is the way to go, that we can exactly count people that way. That's just false. It's false, it's short-sighted, and it's exactly what this Commerce Department has decided to do. I mean, I think it's ridiculous. The Commerce Department and the Census Bureau have chosen to ignore the possibility that sampling could be rejected not only by the Congress, but by the Supreme Court. They're so intent upon char charging ahead with sampling that they refuse to come up with a contingency plan, folks. The Bureau's arrogance offends me because, first of all, without some alternative plan, they are putting our constitutional mandate at risk. And they're also putting at risk four billion, billion with a B, $4 billion of American taxpayers' money. 
It's wrong. It shouldn't be done. And this report should prevail. I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The committee will stand in recess for 15 minutes, and then I would urge all members to please return promptly so that we can conclude the uh, debate on this report and have a vote. The committee stands in recess. First, I want to congratulate you on that fine likeness up there, although I must admit it's the first time I've seen you without glasses. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you. It looks very, very good. Uh, I appreciate the, the fact that we're holding this hearing on this important issue. Uh, as a representative from the state of Wisconsin, I have a keen interest in this topic. This is an issue in Wisconsin that has unified Democrats and Republicans because Wisconsin did such a good job in uh, counting in the 1990 census that we received uh, awards from the federal government. Uh, following that, of course, there was the attempt to uh, take away uh, um, fi federal financing and a congressional seat because the feeling was that we had done such a good job and other seats had done a, a poorer job that they must have been under undercounting. And that brings me to the nub of, of my concern uh, with the whole issue of, of the census and the actual enumeration. I applaud the efforts of Congresswoman Meek uh, to ensure that there is a fair count of minorities. It would be ab abhorrent to me if there was either an intentional or unintentional attempt to undercut, undercount minorities in any census project. The issue, I think, though, goes a little bit beyond that as well, and that is what is the most effective way to ensure that there is no undercount of minorities? And my fear is that if we move toward a estimate or a sampling, that that will uh, in many ways lessen rather than increase the incentive for states and local units of government to do an actual count. If states or local governments believe that all they have to do is do a 90% a count and then they can have their numbers adjusted afterwards, I think that it is going to uh, lower their incentive to have an actual count. I also think that there is, under the current system, some financial incentives for states and local units of government to have an actual count, again, because so many federal dollars are dependent upon uh, the accuracy of a, of a count. It's important, I think, for local governments and states to be as accurate as they can. That's why it's somewhat mystifying to me, coming from a state and a city, that bent over backwards to make sure that everyone was counted, that some states would be less than uh, vigilant in making sure that, that the people that live in that state or those local localities were counted. Having said all that, I am also somewhat suspicious, frankly, uh, of the, the rhetoric that comes from the majority side because I, I have not seen it followed up with hard dollars and any actual enumeration is going to be expensive uh, and it's going to take some higher dollars. And I look at the points made in the minority report about the, the cutting of the census budgets and it makes me somewhat dubious that this um, religious uh, attention being paid to an actual enumeration by the majority side will be paid for. Uh, and that is a concern that I have and it's one that I am sensitive to. I will note that the majority report does state on page 20 the following. Uh, it appears that the fundamental constitutional purpose of the decennial census to apportion the House of Representatives has been de-emphasized. However, this is an element that must take precedence regardless of cost. 
I've, I've never seen a Republican document say, regardless of cost. Uh, I don't know if that's ultimately going to happen, but I do think that we definitely have to put our money where our mouth is here, and, and it's important for us to pay for this. Um, so being sensitive to the concerns of undercounting minorities and at the same time trying to balance the constitutional mandate of an actual enumeration, um, I have decided that I will support this report. Um, but I will remain vigilant to make sure that, that the, the words of the majority are actually followed up with uh, financing. And I think if that happens, then I think we'll reach the goal that everyone in this committee uh, contends is their goal, and that's, that's an accurate count for the people in this country. And having said that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman very much for his comments and would note that I would agree with you that uh, implicit in our report needs to be a recognition that this is not, it cannot be done on the cheap. Uh, that, in fact, in order to get an accurate count and to do what I think the Constitution requires, it's going to cost some money. And as you know, we don't appropriate funds in this committee, but I would certainly uh, join with you and others in making sure that the appropriators do understand that this is something that needs to be, uh, that needs to be financed if it's going to be done at all. And I would now uh, see if any... Uh, the gentlelady from New York, Mrs. Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I really uh, would first of all like to respond to a statement that was made earlier uh, by a member of the other side of the aisle when he uh, claimed that uh, using sampling was uh, unconstitutional. And I'd like uh, for the record to show that the issue has never been addressed by the Supreme Court. And in fact, in every court where it's been raised, the use of sampling has been upheld. And I would like to add to the record the court decisions that have, have upheld the use of sampling and, and really ask Mr. Hostrit if he would put in the record any court case that he's aware of that, that uh, uh, speaks to the other side. I'm not aware of any, and I, and I, uh, uh, and I would like to know exactly what he With, was referring to in his statement. I think uh, what I'd indicate in my remarks is that the issue is still unresolved, however, that there is not a clear, there's not been a clear uh, statement by the Supreme Court either way on the issue, and I think it still, therefore, is, is, uh, is, uh, is very much in play. But, but uh, reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, has not been, it has not been discussed, and the decision has not come from the Supreme Court, but in the other courts, they have always upheld the use of sampling, and I request to put into the record the court decisions that have upheld the use of sampling. Without objection. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, John Kenneth uh, Galbraith once uh, observed that it is statisticians who shape public policy, uh, for society never becomes effectively concerned about social problems until they learn to measure them. Uh, Mr. Galbraith's statement goes to the heart of what we're talking about today, which is, will we accurately measure the characteristics of our society so that we can develop effective social policy? Or will we use uh, political means to block the use of the most accurate uh, tools that are available to us? If we adopt this report today, we will be taking a step backwards and we will be endorsing a policy that emphasizes politics over accuracy, science, and fairness. That is nowhere more evident than in the very first finding of this report that sampling is subjective and problematic. Mr. Chairman, none of the witnesses before this committee questioned the scientific basis of sampling. Three panels convened by the National Academy of Science endorsed the use of sampling in the 2000 census. The American Statistical Association wrote a detailed report which defended the scientific basis of sampling. Sampling is used in nearly every field of science, from astronomy to medicine to zoology. It is used because it is efficient and accurate. I have put to you a, a question posed by the American Statistical Association. Would you insist that your doctor take all of your blood 
to diagnose your condition, or would you prefer that he or she just take a sample? Much of what has been discussed surrounding this report concerns the use of the census for redistricting. But there is an equally important use for these numbers, understanding social problems and designing social policy to deal with those problems. The census is one of our best sources of information on poverty and the only source of information on poverty at the state and local level. We have just passed important legislation on welfare, and although some of us may disagree over certain aspects of it, we all agree that we need to be able to get accurate information on the number of the poor. This report will, will guarantee that the 2000 census is, is less accurate and, and possible, um, and it, it, it may be really the most uh, inaccurate census ever. The large number of, of poor people in this country is a national tragedy, but at least we have an information system that tells us about it. If this committee adopts the report before us today, we may not even have that information much longer. Accuracy in the census is especially important to the city that I represent, New York. Five of the 10 most undercounted congressional districts in the country are in New York City. But the undercount is not just an inner city problem. Census Bureau research shows large undercounts in rural areas as well. In fact, on a percentage basis, some small towns have a much higher undercount rate than New York. Vincent uh, Baraba, the Census Bureau director under Presidents Nixon, Carter, and Reagan, <laughs> in his book on the 1980 census talks about the undercount in Brevard, North Carolina. Brevard is a quiet retirement village in the Blue Ridge Mountains. There the census missed 1,314 out of 6,400 residents. That is an undercount of over 20%. In 1990, 84 of the 101 residents of Benedict, Kansas were missed. Congress has uh, been explicit in its mandate to the Census Bureau. We want a census that is more accurate and less expensive. The Census Bureau worked hard to develop a plan that accomplishes uh, these um, uh, competing demands. This report ignores the advice and testimony of expert after expert and will scuttle years of planning and millions of dollars of research. Why? Where's the evidence? It is certainly not in the report. The conclusions in this report are politically driven, while the issue is one of science. How do we get a census that is fair to all, Gentle ladies. that includes all Americans, that accurately represents who we are? The test should be what is the most accurate and efficient method, not what is politically expedient. So I uh, will vote against this report, and I urge my colleagues uh, to do uh, likewise. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady for her comments. Uh, does anybody else seek recognition to speak on this report? The gentleman, I'll, I'll wait till after the gentleman, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fattah, is recognized for five thank minutes. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to speak in mm -hmm. favor of uh, the point of view that's been articulated by a number of my colleagues. This report um, does not, I believe, deserve a favorable uh, a vote from the committee. We should be working towards the most accurate uh, count that we can have as we begin the next century. We should uh, attempt to be perfecting uh, our democracy, and partly uh, that relates to us having a correct uh, census uh, process. And as has been stated, I think that it's clear that we have an undercount and why we want, would want to continue a process under which policy decisions are driven and political representation is driven through a, uh, a flawed process which can be improved upon. We know it can through the sampling process and therefore I would hope that the committee would uh, strongly consider uh, moving in a 
uh, in a way to correct a problem that has long plagued many states. It would, it's been said, uh, this side of this argument doesn't benefit my home state, but I would have the committee know that it is not our responsibility to just have a parochial concern about uh, any particular state or district we may represent, but to think about the impacts of these policies as they affect the entire nation. So um, I think for states like uh, whether they're California or Florida, wherever the case may be where people are being significantly undercounted, um, that we, all of us, should be prepared to try to open this process up and utilize all of the tools that are now available to our government and to the Census Bureau to have the best count possible. So thank you. The gentleman yields back the balance of time. The Chair and I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Department of Commerce plans to use sampling to make the 2000 Census more accurate and cheaper to conduct than the 1990 Census. The Census undercount was 5.4% in 1940, 1 1.2% in 1980, and about 1.6%, 1 4 million people in 1990. The undercount harms some states disproportionately. About 2.7 percent of California's population was not counted in 1990. The use of sampling would have given the state an additional congressional seat, and it denied us other important benefits in terms of distribution of federal dollars. Uh, the use of sampling would have cost Pennsylvania and Wisconsin a congressional seat each as well. Sampling, uh, and I thought Ms. Maloney's statement was really graphic, sampling is a legitimate way to get the information that would reflect a more accurate census. And it, because of that, it's been endorsed by the National Academy of Sciences, the American Statistical Association, General Accounting Office, Department of Commerce, Inspector General, 2000 Census Advisory Committee, U.S. Conference of Mayors, National League of Cities, National Conference of State Legislatures, National Governors Association, U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Business Roundtable. What objective criteria could the committee have to dispute the findings of three separate panels of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Statistical Association to indicate that sampling is a way for us to get an accurate picture of the population? For that reason, I will uh, sign dissenting views uh, should this majority report uh, uh, pass. I know if it does pass, it's uh, simply a statement of the committee itself. It has no legal effect. But I think that uh, our committee should not be going against the best scientific way to get the most accurate census. So for that reason, I uh, oppose the, uh, uh, the report that's before us and yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, recognize the gentleman from the state of New Mexico. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm about to actually yield my time to you to respond to the gentleman from California. However, I... I would like to gently suggest that we come to the point where we can vote on this. I think the, I think I think the different sides have been adequately expressed here. I yield We're to you, Mr. Chairman. Direction. I thank you, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. Just to correct the record uh, that Mrs. Meek indicated a little earlier that there was going to be sampling conducted on American Indian reservations, et cetera. And I would just note for the record that in the uh, explanation of the uh, re-engineering of the census put out by the Department of Commerce, they do state that the Census Bureau will not use sampling to complete the enumeration of American Indian reservations in Alaska Native villages, in the Virgin Islands, or in the Pacific Island territories. So I just, they, uh, certainly. I just wanted to correct that misrepresentation, Mr. Chairman. I did not say they would not count on Indian reservations. I mentioned that as an example where the undercount might occur. I see. Yes, sir. The chair would now recognize uh, you. I yield back my time and yield to the gentlelady from Florida, Mr. Mr. Thurman. Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that. And um, I know that m the gentlewoman from Florida has a few more comments that she'd like to make, and certainly would like to yield my my time to her because I know that uh, as both of us sat in the state senate and struggling with budgets and um, additional people that were not counted, we figured out it was something like $350 per family that we lost in funds, which meant health care for housing, block grants for social services and things of that nature. So this issue becomes a very big issue for some of our states and Sunbelt areas where we're not seeing that. So at that time, I would let, uh, I would like to yield my time to Ms. Meek, who I think will expound on many of these issues. I thank the gentlelady, and I'll make this short, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if this committee understands 
how this procedure is really going to work and how it worked in the past. And then you can sort of envision how some of this undercount happened in that they tried to interview everyone in the last census. Well, they were not able to do so. So you will not be able to do so in this census. That won't happen this time. Think of all of the problems you will have, hiring the number of people you need, processing the data. And these data are not easy to, to put together. And as a result of it, you're going to end up with another undercount. I propose to you that of the use of sampling for that 10 percent, which the Census Department has, uh, has uh, recommended, will not bring as many mistakes as trying to enumerate and to count everyone. Remember, we're not saying uh, not to enumerate. We're saying that those that are not counted, like 10 percent of the, those people who are out there in the boonies in the rural areas and those people who are in the inner cities who deserve to be counted are not counted. And that's historically so. So I guess what this committee is assuming if they adopt this report or is saying those people don't really count. We are going to go forward with the report that you know from historical precedent have not been counted in the past. So you continue not to improve it. Uh, why not improve it? You did the enumeration before, and it had a significant undercount. So they have looked at it from an academic and a statistical point of view. What's the problem with using sampling for 10 percent of it? I don't see that big problem, but I will. I do see it will be bring a much better count. I know you're going to, as Congress people, try to direct the Commerce Department to do its best, as the last Congress did. You can't do it by going back to what was, because you know it did not work. Um, it's just uh, something that from this committee that's supposed to be looking at the reformation of government and to improve the techniques and methodologies. I think we're remiss if we don't look at all uh, scientific and statistical ways to improve it. <coughs> And I really, again, urge, Mr. Chairman, that the committee turn down this report by voting no. Thank the gentlelady. If no one else seeks to be recognized, the vote now is to report the, uh, the uh, report on sampling and statistical adjustment in the decennial census, fundamental flaws, to the full House. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask for a recorded vote, vote please, sir. Uh, the uh, the staff. Uh, the uh, re recorded vote has been requested, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Klinger? Aye. Mr. Klinger votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Burton? Mr. Hastert? Mrs. Morella, Mr. Shays, Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. Schiff, Mr. Schiff votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton, Mr. Zellov, Mr. McHugh, Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Aye. Mr. Horn votes aye. <coughs> Mr. Micah? I'm sorry, again, I wasn't paying attention. Could you tell me what the vote was on, is on? On the final approval of the draft report? This is the final census. vote and, uh, yeah. on the census report. Well, at this time, I'd like to have a little bit more time to think about it, and I'll pass. Thank you. Mr. Blut? Mr. Blute votes aye. Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Tate? Mr. Tate votes aye. Mr. Chrysler? Mr. Chrysler votes aye. Mr. Gutnick? Mr. Souter? Mr. Martini? Mr. Martini votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Flanagan? Mr. Flanagan votes aye. Mr. Bass? 
Mr. LaTourette? Mr. Sanford? Aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Ehrlich? Mr. Ehrlich votes aye. Mr. Klug? Ms. Collins of Illinois? Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Spratt? Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Condent? Mr. Condent votes no. Mr. Peterson? Mr. Sanders? Mrs. Thurman? Mrs. Thurman votes no. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Collins of Michigan? Ms. Norton? Mr. Moran? No. Mr. Moran votes no. Mr. Green? No. Mr. Green votes no. Mrs. Meek? No. Mrs. Meek votes no. Mr. Fatah? No. Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Brewster? Mr. Holden? Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Gilman? Aye. Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Burton? Mr. Hastert? Mrs. Morella? Ms. Ross Layton? Mr. Zeliff? Mr. Zeliff votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Gutnick? Aye. Mr. Gutnick votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Bass? Mr. LaTourette? Mr. Klug? Mrs. Collins of Illinois? Mr. Lantos? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mrs. Mr. Spratt? Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Peterson? Mr. Peterson votes aye. Mr. Sanders? Ms. Collins of Michigan? Ms. Norton? Mr. Brewster? Mr. Holden? Is, there any, is anybody not recorded who wishes to be recorded? Mr. Sa Mr. Satter, you're not recorded. Mr. Satter votes aye. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton votes aye. How is Mrs. Mrs. Morella voted? Mrs. Morella is not voted. Um, Morella votes no. Ms. Morella votes no. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman. There are 12 ayes and 12 nays. I mean, excuse me, there are 22 ayes and 12 nays. And the report is approved. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me just make okay. one statement, Ms. Meek. Staff will have uh, three days to make all necessary technical and conforming changes, and members will have three days to file additional and dissenting views, which I anticipate will, in fact, be forthcoming. Uh, the, we have two additional items of business to conclude before this uh, meeting is, uh, can be adjourned. The clerk will now call up H.R. 3877. And without objection, the text before us will be considered as the chairman's mark. The clerk. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment, and I would now recognize Chairman McHugh of the Postal Service Committee uh, to discuss H.R. 3877. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now that we have the easy stuff out of the way, let's get on to some controversial business here. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, I move to H.R. 3877, a bill designating the United States Post Office building located at 351 West Washington Street in Camden, Arkansas, as the David H. Pryor Post Office building be favorably reported by the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight. Mr. Uh, Chairman, this legislation was introduced by Representative Jay Dickey of Arkansas on July 23 of this year, and the bill was co-sponsored when introduced by the entire House delegation of that state, co-sponsored by, uh, uh, as the committee rules require all of the members. Uh, as this is purely a post office naming bill, and as the United States Postal Service is off budget, uh, any costs associated with the legislation would not result in any budgetary uh, implications. Obviously, Mr. Chairman, this bill honors Senator David H. Pryor, who served as former chair of the Senate Subcommittee on Post Office and Civil Service and currently serves as that panel's ranking minority member. His other committee assignments include agriculture, finance, and aging. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the senator, a favorite son of the county seat of Wachita, Arkansas, obviously has a very long and distinguished record in the public service. I'd like not to extend the proceedings of this committee any longer here today, but rather ask unanimous consent that my extended be remarks be entered uh, in the record in their entirety. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I would thereafter uh, move the bill and urge my colleagues to uh, support this legislation, giving, I think, a very just honor to a gentleman who has done this uh, institution of Congress proud and has served this nation and who will be uh, soon leaving us to go to uh, other challenges. Does any other member wish to be recognized to speak uh, on this uh, issue? Uh, Mr. Moran, you were waving to somebody, or were you seeking recognition? <laughs> I don't have the one. No, I'm fast. I, don't, I if, can't figure out anything I could say of substance on this. Thank you. I'm, I'm the the gentlelady from Florida. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to submit for the record a statement from Ms. Collins, Cotton Collins. Carter's Collins. Without objection, so ordered. So if no one else seeks to speak, the vote is now to report H.R. 3877 favorably to the full committee, or to the full House, for consideration. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Uh, the ayes do have it, and H.R. 3877 will be reported favorably to the full House for consideration. I will now turn to Chairman John Micah of the Civil Service Subcommittee to introduce and speak uh, on S-868, a bill to, to provide authority for leave transfer for federal employees who are adversely affected by disasters or emergencies and for other purposes. And the chair now recognizes Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I know how the guy feels like that's at the end of the parade with the shovel. Mr. Uh, chairman, thank you uh, for recognizing me. and. Uh, the bill that we have before us is Senate Bill uh, 868, the Federal Employees Emergency Leave Transfer Act of 1995. It authorizes the President to direct the Office of Personnel Management to establish emergency leave transfer programs. These could be established when a substantial number of federal employees are adversely affected by a disaster or emergency. Examples of these situations would include natural disasters and emergency situations uh, such as the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, this bill passed the uh, other body by voice vote on October 19, 1995. The subcommittee proposes today no amendments. Mr. Chairman, there are precedents for this kind of leave bank. In 1988, Congress authorized a five-year test of voluntary leave transfer and leave bank programs within federal agencies, and that's public law. Uh, 10566. These programs were designed to help employees uh, faced with a medical or family emergency who have already exhausted all available leave. This five year experiment was very successful, in fact, and both programs were made permanent in 1994 under Public Law 103 103. In 1991, Congress also created a special leave bank to benefit federal employee rever reservists who were called to active duty during the Persian Gulf conflict. These res reservists were uh, able to use the donated leave to ease their reentry into civilian life, and that's Public Law 102-25. The leave donated by many federal employees for this special program significantly assisted these Persian Gulf veterans. 
Uh, this experience has shown uh, that uh, special leave transfer programs which operate outside the normal programs can be appropriate and effective. Mr. Chairman, this bill will benefit our federal employees without imposing a significant cost to the taxpayers, and I urge that we report S-868 favorably. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the, 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 now the chairman would be pleased to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran. Thanks very much, Chairman Klinger. And uh, who's that handsome guy over to the to the left of you there? I I, I so don't recognize. Can't recognize. Him. Him. That's right. <laughs> oh, I, I do it's know him that I'm talking about. I, <laughs> I do know that the gentleman on the right probably disapproves of the. Of the, of the <laughs> I do recognize the gentleman on the right. The, the um, uh, this is the uh, the right thing to do. It's also a, a neat thing to do to enable federal employees to provide some of their surplus leave for colleagues when they really need it. Uh, it's um, practiced at state and local levels frequently. We do it, I know, in Alexandria when I was mayor, and it was very helpful. No reason not to do it. It doesn't cost the federal taxpayer a penny. Uh, very minimal administrative costs. And, uh, and sometimes you really have emergencies where it is necessary. And uh, to have the law block it uh, would certainly be inappropriate and counterproductive. So I'm glad that we're moving this forward. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Chairman Micah and uh, our full committee chairman uh, Klinger's uh, support for it. So thank you, Mr. Klinger. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the uh, gentleman yields back his time, and the uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Ms. Morella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just simply offer my full and very strong support for this bill, which is humane and very appropriate. Yield back. Um, if nobody else uh, seeks recognition on uh, this matter, uh, uh, the chair would recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Mrs. Norton, for whatever comment she might choose to make. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your indulgence. I just want to say for the record that I was given blood, and that's why I was not here to vote on, to vote no on the report on sampling. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, if no one else wishes to speak, the clerk will now call up S-868. S-868, to provide authority for leave transfer for federal employees who are adversely affected by disasters or emergencies and for other purposes. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment. Uh, does anybody seek to amend S-868? If no one else seeks to speak or amend, the vote is now to favorably report S-868 to the full House for consideration. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes do have it, and uh, S-868 will be favorably reported to the full House for consideration. Staff will have three days to make all necessary technical and informing changes, and that having concluded uh, the business of the committee, the committee stands adjourned.
The Senate adjourned October 3rd and the House on the 4th. During one veto was overridden. The new Congress reconvenes on January 7th. You can see live coverage of the Senate here on C-SPAN 2 and the House on our companion network C-SPAN.